Hello everybody and welcome to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons on Patreon voted for me to highlight the fight on Oak Ridge on the first day during the Battle of Gettysburg. Ever since I read my first book about Gettysburg, I have been enthralled by the first day's fighting, especially the fight for Oak Ridge and McPherson's Ridge. So I was extremely excited when the patrons voted for Oak Ridge to be animated. Remember, if you want to vote for a battle to be animated, all you have to do is join the Patreon page for $1 and you can cast your ballot. A reminder, the map is not to scale. Additionally, the Union packed a lot of units into a small area, which makes it challenging to represent their position on the field. But I want to show each regiment, so some of the map will be of scale and some will not. Without any further ado, let's jump right into the battle. Major General Henry Heath's division, under Lieutenant General A.P. Hill, made first contact with Buford's cavalry across Willoughby Run, and it would be Heath and Major General Dorsey Pender who would engage with the Union First Corps under Major General John F. Reynolds for control of McPherson's Ridge. As the Iron Brigade and the other brigades of the First Corps engaged Heath, Reynolds' other divisions went north to extend the Union right flank along Oak Ridge. One of the Lieutenant General Richard S. Ewell's divisions under Major General Robert Rhodes was moving south and would soon engage with the newly positioned Union troops of the 1st Corps on Oak Ridge. Lysander Cutler's brigade had tangled with Davis's brigade of Heath's division earlier and took up the position on Oak Ridge. Baxter's brigade would move to Cutler's right. Colonel Roy Stone's men had also engaged with Davis and pulled back to the Chambersburg Pike. Four of Rhodes' brigades were ready for deployment. Brigadier General Stephen Ramser's brigade was still marching toward the battlefield. Additionally, Rhodes sent another brigade under George P. Doles further to the east. As Rhodes' division was forming, he detached two regiments from O'Neill's brigade, the 5th Alabama to fill the gap between Doles' brigade and the rest of the division, and the 3rd Alabama to reinforce Junius Daniels' left. The reason he did this is unclear, but this put Edward O'Neill in a poor situation for launching an attack without two of his regiments. In a series of miscommunications, O'Neill ordered his brigade forward before the rest of the division was ready to attack. The Alabamians were hit by an enfilading fire from the 45th New York and artillery. Rhodes rode forward and ordered the 5th Alabama to support the brigade. O'Neill's brigade lasted only 15 minutes against Baxter's brigade before they fell back to the cover of a fence row where they fell to the ground breathless from a hard fight and attempting to avoid rifle fire. Brigadier General Alfred Iverson, seeing O'Neill's attack, moved his men out as soon as possible, just as O'Neill had fallen back. Iverson aimed his troops for the gap between Cutler and Baxter, hoping to break the line there. However, Division Commander John Robinson saw the situation and quickly ordered the 11th Pennsylvania and the 97th New York to plug the hole and move the 83rd and 88th Pennsylvania regiments west. As the North Carolinians neared the Union line, Southerners noticed as the troops bounded forward not knowing certainly where the enemy was, for his whole line with every flag was concealed, not one of them was to be seen. Baxter's men hid themselves behind a stone wall and relied on the element of surprise to push back the rebels. Daniel ordered the 3rd Alabama to support Iverson's attack and then Daniel himself moved his massive brigade toward the enemy. Meanwhile, Iverson's men got startled by the volley of rifle fire that seemed to come out of nowhere. The mini balls tore through the ranks. The Tar Heels, who had been battered two months earlier at Chancellorsville, was again taking heavy casualties, and Daniel's men were too far away to give them adequate support as they stood face to face with the enemy. Cutler's men took the initiative and advanced on Iverson, and the leftmost regiments broke and headed to the rear, leaving the 12th North Carolina alone behind a small rise in front of the enemy. Daniel was on his way, but he could see Stone's men hunkered down behind the Chambersburg Pike and had to split his brigade. He sent the 32nd and 45th regiments and the 2nd North Carolina Battalion against Stone and the rest of the brigade, as well as the remnants of Iverson against Cutler. While Daniel was organizing an attack, John Robinson Cutler's division commander saw the plight of Cutler's brigade and relieved his men with Gabriel Paul's brigade and shifted Baxter further to the southeast. 
On the Union left, Stone's brigade saw Daniel's men start to form for an attack, and the 149th Pennsylvania dashed for the unfinished railroad cut. As the North Carolinians were crossing a fence, the Keystone State troops fired a deadly fire into the Tar Heels. The 32nd North Carolina helped in the attack, but again, Daniels' men could not budge the Pennsylvanians. They made a resolute stand in the face of overwhelming numbers. Eventually, the rebels were forced to fall back. An artillery barrage was the only thing that made the 149th Pennsylvania move back to the Chambersburg Pike. Daniel's brigade was new to the Army of Northern Virginia, but Daniel proved his ability when he scraped together the remnants of his and Iverson's men with the 32nd North Carolina guarding the flank. Ramser had finally made it to the field and Rhodes ordered him to help with the new assault by the entire division. The 30th and 14th North Carolina closed the gap between Iverson and O'Neill, and the 2nd and 4th North Carolina extended O'Neill's left flank. Whether the Union line could have withstood the assault that Rhodes' division was about to launch will never be known, because as they prepared to attack, the Union troops in front of the seminary to the south were hit by Pettigrew and Pender Southerners, and Baxter was ordered to help them. However, the Union line was collapsing on all sides, even north of the town. Paul, getting word he needed to pull out, knew that his men could not escape without being harassed by Rhodes' men. So he gave their duty of fighting a delaying action to the 16th Maine as the rest of the brigade retreated. The 200 Maine men saw the rebel juggernaut approach and delivered volley after volley into the enemy, falling back and taking cover and firing again. When they realized they could hold out no longer, they tore up their flag and hid it in their pockets and broke the staff in half rather than have the shame of getting it captured. The commander stuck his sword into the ground and broke it in two. Some men surrendered and some ran to rejoin the corps. But when all was said and done, of the 200 men who started the fight, all but four officers and 38 men were killed, wounded, or captured. The resilience of the Union forces in this part of the battle just amazes me. Rhodes was more than competent as a brigade commander, but he let miscommunication allow his brigades to enter the fight piecemeal, getting many of his men slaughtered. The standouts of this on the Union side was Cutler's Brigade who fought nearly non-stop from the time they entered the battle and the 16th Maine. On the Confederate side, Junius Daniel demonstrated his organization skills and his ability to rally retreating men of other brigades. I hope this video made the fight on Oak Ridge at Gettysburg more clear and that you may have learned something new. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you Friday for an eyewitness account of Pickett's Charge.